Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the workshop on water loss control in the Great Lakes region. We're very pleased you're here. We're pleased for those of you that are online that are listening to this webinar. Uh, we will have uh, a series of presentations for you today that we hope you will find useful and interesting that are part of the project that we have been uh, doing. No, no audio yet. We, we have no audio yet. So to give you a little bit of background on the project, we'll um, go ahead and talk about it. But first, I'd like to offer the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin to do a welcome. Uh, they have been our host here today. The mission has been a terrific partner. So I'd like to, to offer the opportunity formally to the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin to welcome you to their facility today. Good morning. I'm Jeff Stone. I'm the Division Administrator for Water, Telecommunications, and Consumer Affairs. I want to welcome you. Uh, to our facilities here, and uh, I want to thank uh, the Alliance for Water Efficiency and uh, our other partners for uh, having this opportunity for utilities here in Wisconsin and others to learn uh, more about the projects that you're working on and how we can improve water efficiency. It's a focus that we have as a commission, and uh, we're also uh, glad that we can pay a part in uh, helping to advance the goals of uh, having efficient use of water and efficient, uh, high-quality water utilities throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mary Ann Dickinson. I'm the CEO of a nonprofit organization called the Alliance for Water Efficiency. And we have been working in the Great Lakes area. Uh, I actually grew up in the Great Lakes myself. I'm a former Detroit resident of long standing. So we, we do have great interest and empathy for what you're going through here in the Great Lakes. Everyone else in the country thinks you have plenty of water, but we know that with the Great Lakes issues come also a lot of challenges in utility management, and water loss management is one of those challenges. So we did apply to the Mott Foundation. We got a special project grant from them to work with you on this topic. Um, we're very grateful to the Mott Foundation for uh, their support of this activity. And the goal is to help you in the Great Lakes, help Great Lakes utilities identify opportunities to reduce their non-revenue water and to provide you the tools that you need and the technical assistance that you need to address this important issue. Um, we will also today be presenting two case studies from two Great Lakes utilities that work with us closely in this project. And so you will see some results from their audits and what that means. We'll spend some time in the morning going through how you interpret those performance indicators and the results of those audits so that if you see the results, you'll have a uh, you know, better understanding of the conclusions that we came to. So we'll talk about that. And this workshop and the webinar that is accompanying this, and for those of you on the webinar, we're, we're, we're especially pleased you joined us. It's part of the project's goal of outreach to Great Lakes utilities in general. We'll be doing a lot more of that uh, before we're through. Uh, because we want to help you reduce your water losses and develop proactive management plans to ensure that that happens. Um, one of the special topics that we're addressing today is the issue of lead service lines and the replacement of lead service lines. And we've got a terrific presentation by Tom Hyken and later on in the day. So don't leave early, whether you're in the room or on the webinar, because that's a, a great presentation that I think you will get a lot of information from. Um, and so um, at this point, um, I want to just give a few basic instructions for those of you that are on the webinar. Um, we're going to cover, we're planning to cover in the webinar the entire workshop agenda, which you should have in front of you either in the room or just recently mailed out to webinar participants. And there will be a lunch break, um, and we'll sort of stop the webinar at that point, but then resume again when we uh, take up with presentations. And the audio for the webinar, if you're not hearing my voice, but you're seeing this screen, the, the audio is either through your telephone or your computer microphone or speakers. The GoToWebinar screen will give you instructions for that. But you will be muted, the phone line will be muted so that we don't get your background noise uh, into the webinar. Uh, your coffee cup clattering and paper shuffling and you know phone ringing and people coming in to talk to you. That all now is muted because we're recording this webinar for future use. So those people who aren't able to come today or participate today will be able to log in for free to a webinar link and see this entire day uh, and 
be able to relive this entire day. So we'll make that available not only to those of you in the room, but those who couldn't join us today. Um, but just because we're muting the phone line doesn't mean we don't want your questions. So in the GoToWebinar screen, there is a dialog box where you can type in questions. Feel free to type in questions all throughout the day. Um, we will be having defined question periods. We'll read your questions out to the, the workshop as a whole. So you can still participate and get your questions answered even if you're not here. Uh, so just make sure that if you have questions to type them in the box and uh, Chelsea here will be uh, following along. So at this point I'd like to kick off our agenda and start uh, the actual presentations and I'd like to introduce to you our uh, partners in this project, Water Systems Optimization. And you'll hear today from Reinhard Sturm and Lucy Andrews. Uh, Lucy also is a Great Lakes um, native, so um, welcome them to come up here and, and start going through the, the presentations on how you can manage your non-revenue water. Thanks, Marianne. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? As Marianne mentioned, I am Lucy, and I'm from Minnesota, so I'm, I'm close to home right now, and it's lovely to be back for a little bit of fall, but also some thunderstorms. I live in San Francisco right now where thunderstorms don't exactly happen, so it's been a great little homecoming here. I'm joined by my colleague. Uh, yeah. Good morning, Reinhard Sturm. As you can hear, I'm not from the Great Lakes. Um, <laughs> I cannot hide that, but I'm, I'm equally excited and pleased to be here and really looking forward to a full day of, of water loss control and um, yeah, get, getting everybody on the same page, what can be done and how it's best done. And we hope throughout the day you'll ask us questions, um, both about sort of general terms and methodology, but also how you might take uh, what we're talking about and apply it to your own system. Uh, this is uh, a topic that's not meant to exist in a vacuum, so um, bring yourselves and bring your utilities into the room as we talk about water loss control. So today's agenda, what we want to cover today is, first of all, how do we evaluate where we are? So, so what's, what's the level of losses that we're experiencing in any given system? What are the tools out there in the industry, the best practices to come to the point where we have a full appreciation of our water losses, but also an appreciation of our data sources and the quality of our data sources, because let's throw that right out there, nobody has perfect data, nobody is perfect. Um, with that appreciation, then, we can graduate to, to look at intervention. How can we intervene against our water losses and what are the tools and, and technologies out there to reduce our water losses? Always in mind um, that it needs to be driven by economics. You don't want to spend more money on reducing your losses than what you're recovering. That's, that's really that's the main focus of um, proper water loss control. So. As we're going through this, uh, we'll, we'll cover the, the audits, the audit methodology, the free audit software. Um, quick show of hands, who in here has worked and, and interacted with the AAA free audit software? So for the folks um, that are online, it's about, I call it 35% of the room. Um, so that's great, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that. And over the lunch break also, we'll have some, some time to actually interact with the audit software and, and get a little bit more familiar with it. Uh, one of the key components in the audit software is data grading. This goes back to my statement before that nobody has perfect data. And there's one key component in, in the audit software where we are able to assign a data grade and just acknowledge this is the, the confidence that I have in the data that is informing my calculations um, and there's no good or bad. It's the, the, the best grade is the one that is really truly reflecting your data and your operations. With that, We'll then touch on component analysis, and you will hear me speak a lot about that. And Lucy makes fun of me because I, but by, the, by the life of me, I cannot pronounce it correctly, analysis, but that, that's, that's what it is. Um, the thing, component, I mean, it's so, so funny that I have such a hard time to really pronounce it properly because I, our company and me, me personally, I have designed the, the, the software package for the Water Research Foundation to do that. But basically well, what this, this uh, does for you is when you look at, at the water balance, it gives you an appreciation of your water loss volume of your real losses, right, the leakage losses. But that's where it stops and the component analysis is the next step then to break your real losses, your leakage losses down in its subcomponents and that's really the necessary step to design a program to intervene against your losses because not all of it is recoverable. And we'll, we'll talk about that and that leads us into intervention strategies. 
and then after the lunch break we'll then talk about the two case studies that we've been working on, Madison and Ann Arbor, and then we'll get a great presentation from Tom on, on lead service line replacement, and that should round out uh, the, the day today. So, I've asked already one question, I think, if you move forward. Uh, who is familiar with your system's water loss levels? How, how do you communicate your water loss level? What, what kind of numbers do you have in mind when somebody asks you, okay, what's your water loss? We do it by percentages uh, up till now, yeah. Percentages? Anybody else dealing in percentages? There's a nodding going around. That's very common. I mean, that's that's what we're dealing with, and that's also a, a challenge, I think, from from the regulatory side. Uh, when when asking, so what what are you guys doing? Where are you? What's your percent water loss? One of the things we want to uh, make sure today that you get an appreciation for how misleading percentages can be, and and how they really do not lend themselves for benchmarking to look at performances between utilities. That's a key component we want to cover today. Um, so this goes back to the familiarity of the water audit software. Who has completed the software? That was about 35%, so I hope we'll, we'll get some, some more information out there to you to get familiar with the software. That's the standard package uh, promoted by AAA to complete a water audit and water balance. Um, the next question, who has um, been involved with assigning data validity scores? So those who have interacted with the audit software, I assume, also looked into the data validity scores and grading. There's some loading going on there. We'll spend some more time on that as well to get a full appreciation for that. Uh, the data validity grading uh, is not like in school. We don't all want to have a 10 even though the, the, the highest grade is a 10, but typically that, that's not a realistic reflection of what's going on. And on top of it, it most likely is even cost prohibitive to, to have perfect grades everywhere because it takes a lot of effort and, and, and money to, to actually be fully in, full in compliance with that. Next. And who of you has gone to the, the extent of really digging into the data that informs the audit, who so sort of took a billing data set and, and took it apart or reviewed in detail your production data, so sort of the daily volumes. One person, all right, welcome. Um, okay, that sets us up, gives, gives us a little bit of appreciation for, for where your folks are. Um, so water auditing, there seems to be um, a small 30% of the, the, the folks who have done this uh, what is it about? I mean, it's a systematic approach uh, to look at all the volumes sent into the distribution system, all the volumes that you, you then deliver to your customers or that you need for operational uses. Certainly, we're far away from unaccounted for water. We're not talking about unaccounted for water anymore. AWA in 2003 abandoned unaccounted for water because we can't account for all of our water using this methodology using a standardized approach. Key to the auditing process, as I said before, is um, the, the validity of your data sources. And there might be the case that as you're starting out with your auditing process that you realize a lot of the data I don't have a lot of confidence behind. That's absolutely fine. What that means is you're going to continue getting better data over the years. And when you reach a level that, that you're confident enough in your data, only then it makes sense to actually spend money on intervention. Otherwise, you might be spending money on, on issues that aren't there, that are more related to data quality issues rather than an, a real issue in your distribution network. And then it's communication. As we started out before, we're all dealing in percentages, but um, that there's some, some real concern about only speaking in percentages and thinking in percentages because really it doesn't, doesn't help you a lot in terms of uh, displaying where truly the efficiency of your system is. So here's the water audit. Absolutely. All right, so in the theme of accounting for volumes in a systematic nature, we work with this visual display called a water balance in which we will categorize all of the volumes we know about and then different volumes of water loss so that we're accounting for everything. You'll hear us harping on the fact that unaccounted for water doesn't exist, 
I hope that by the end of the day you'll believe me. Um, but in the process of compiling a water balance, um, it's a mass balance. It's not rocket science. We're talking about arithmetic, addition and subtraction of volumes to use the information that we have to then fill in the gaps. So we'll start on the left with volumes of supply and production and then move rightward so that we're allocating some of the volume we put into our distribution system then to consumption, to sales, to operational use, to things that we authorize and we know about and we track in some form or another. Uh, having accounted for supply and consumption, we end up in the world of water loss. And this is where we start to talk about the distinct forms of loss, whether they're real physical leakage that a lot of folks are familiar with, or water that goes missing, either due to instrument inaccuracy, meter under registration, or paper and tracking errors. In the process of accounting, we worry about <coughs> the accuracy of the information we're using. Because if we get any of these steps wrong through the addition and subtraction of volumes, those errors will propagate and end up in our estimations of water loss. So if we overestimate the volume of water we put into our system, we will also overestimate the volume of water that we lose from our system. And so small details and accuracy does indeed matter. Um, and in the process, we also want to think about the money that, that is behind the water balance. How much is our water worth? What are we paying to produce it? What are we getting in revenue when we sell it? And then what are the economic opportunities of going after water losses? Reinhard will talk a lot about cost effectiveness, um, and, and the goal is not zero leakage. Let me put out a disclaimer now. The goal is cost effective levels of loss. Of course, having accounted for all of our volumes, you'll hear us use the terms apparent loss and real loss. Apparent meaning paper losses, uh, metering errors, tracking errors, systematic data issues that ooze water, and then real losses, leakage losses um, on, on wide scopes, so ranging from little seeps and drips to explosions that eat up Main Street. So everybody agreeing that our customer meters most likely are not 100% accurate, right? That's, that's part of our water loss and, and that's a key component to evaluate actually what is the level of under registration from our customer meters uh, because that leads us then to an understanding of our real loss volume. We've spoken a little bit about data reliability and data validity and accuracy. These are all related concepts. They're just different ways of approaching the question, does my data story make sense? Uh, you know, when you look at an example like this, this graph of monthly total production, immediately looking at the month of May, my suspicions are aroused. And it would be incumbent upon me as an auditor to go after this question and say, what's going on in May? Did that actually happen? Is this a true representation of my system's performance? Or is there something hidden in data sources that I ought to dig into? Um, we're looking about for data that's complete and consistent and accurate. And if it's not, that's okay, but it's important to acknowledge. Then lastly, we talk about communicating water distribution efficiency. The audit software that we'll work with produces a suite of performance indicators for you that go beyond percentage terms to talk about volumes of apparent loss and real loss in more meaningful terms both in terms that are normalized and able to be used for benchmarking, as well as financial terms, so that you can appreciate what's on the table in terms of money. And in the process, you'll hear me use the three Vs. We like to talk about volumes, <coughs> values, and validity in the process. And all three are important considerations in water audit. All right. So what are water losses? Well, what comes to mind when, when I'm asking you guys, what comes to mind uh, what have you experienced as, as contributing to water losses? Do we have leaks? Yep. And in fact, it's often common that we'll walk into a workshop and somebody will sit down with a gigantic cup of coffee and say, I was up all night dealing with the distribution system leak and now I'm at a workshop talking about water loss. What irony. That's a very common situation. So uh, leaks tend to jump to people's minds sure. when they think about water loss. But the, the trick there is that, you know, those leaks that find you typically are a small portion of your total leakage loss uh, portfolio. It's, it's the smaller stuff that doesn't find you that actually contributes a lot. Uh, but beyond that, when we're talking about water loss, as we said before, it's also your customer meters. Customer meters are not reading 100% accurate. Um, customers might, might steal water from you. You might have some issues in the paper trail from reading the meters to issuing bill. Uh, that there's uh, some, some loopholes in there where you're losing out on, on revenue. All of this contributes to what we call non-revenue water, water that you're not generating revenue for. And since we're in the business of, of 
producing a product and delivering a product, it's in our most interest also to get paid for the product that we're producing. We put a lot of effort in it uh, to make it reliable, to make it safe. So really appreciating how much of that product that we're producing um, doesn't generate revenue for us is, is a key consideration here. And you'll note that we're using the terms non-revenue water and water loss slightly distinctly. There are versions of, of authorized consumption, water that's used legitimately, for which you don't receive revenue. We're talking about system flushing or firefighting. Those are important things to sustain the health of your system and also of your community. Um, those aren't water losses. That's perfectly legitimate use. But we allocate that to non-revenue water because it's not earning you income. And as I said before, I mean, this is a little bit repetitive, showing you the terms again. So on, on the paper losses, we have apparent losses mostly coming from, from your customer meters. But then we have real losses, what is also called leakage. And the repetition here is really on purpose because a lot of these terms are new to you guys and, and you'll hear them throughout the day. So in order for you guys to, to get familiar with it and, and really have a visual of what we're talking about when we're throwing apparent loss or real loss terms at you, this is just a reminder again what we're talking about. So in terms of specific definitions, apparent losses is the volume of water that does indeed reach a customer or an end user, but it's not registered or properly tracked, and so you don't receive revenue. That's an apparent loss. It hasn't leaked from your system. It did get to a destination. And we value apparent losses at retail rate because were you to have tracked that water and received income for it, it would have been at that rate that you charge your customers. So when we talk about apparent loss recovery, what we're really talking about is revenue recovery. How do we increase our ability to generate revenue given that we've delivered the water? Um, reducing apparent losses doesn't change the volume of water that you have to produce because you have to feed that water into the system to get to that end user, but it does have implications for your bottom line. And sometimes when, when you look at the economics and do this evaluation where you have a breakdown between your apparent and your real losses and you put the dollar values on those volumes, um, you'll see that you know, my first priority is actually not on, on the leakage side, not on the real loss side, it's on the apparent loss side because the value of that volume that I'm delivering but not generating revenue for is so much higher and that leads you into you know, more targeted meter testing or replacement of your customer meters, uh, but it all needs the data and, and the appreciation for where are you and what is the value of that volume. Conversely, real losses indeed is water that leaks from your system prior to reaching an end user. We'll work with the terms leaks and seeps and breaks and failures pretty interchangeably. They connote different magnitudes, but for us it all means real physical leakage losses. Uh, and sometimes real losses will provoke a scenario like this. I had somebody in a class the other day say, I've got one up for you. I have a picture of a leak that swallowed a fire in. So I've been meaning to replace that in the slide. Um, real losses, of course, uh, have a component that is financial because you have to produce that water at a variable production cost. There's an expense associated with pumping and power and chemicals. But it also has other softer things we have to consider. Leakage has a public relations component. When this sort of thing happens in your town, I'm sure that both the public and journalists pick up on it and they report on this. Um, leakage losses uh, also have uh, an important, uh, that it's important to think about leakage when you manage your infrastructure because uh, when we talk about things like the intervention strategies, pressure management or infrastructure renewal, we're not just talking about leakage, we're also talking about asset management. And so we want to think about the relationship between the water that leaks and its expense and its value, and then the infrastructure from which it is leaking. But then also, to, just to, to round this out, so when we're talking about real losses, leakage losses, uh, the valuation is a different one, right? Uh, we're not valuing our, our real losses, our leakage losses at retail cost. We're valuing our, our leakage losses, our real losses at typically variable production cost. So what does it cost you? To produce a unit of water that you wanted to deliver to customers but didn't get there, or at the cost if you're importing water from, from a wholesaler, and that's probably the, the valuation you're going to use there. But very distinct valuation between apparent losses and real losses. And when you recover real losses, you're reducing the volume that you have to produce. So in a sense, it's a conservation measure. Um, containing leakage is one way to think about meeting your demand. Uh, we were talking with some folks the other day and they said, we're developing a new supply, we need to drill a new well, 
it will cost us a few million dollars, what is my alternate option in the world of leakage containment? It may be a more cost-effective proposal not to create new sources and develop new supply, but instead deal with the water you've already produced and contain leakage. All right, so here are the four general steps uh, that uh, encompass a water loss control program, the development of a water loss control program. So first of all, we got to understand our volumes, our water loss volumes, and the key tool there is the AWA Water Audit that we'll now talk a lot about uh, the process of putting an audit together. From there, uh, once you have the appreciation for your real losses and for your apparent losses, it's about breaking those down into its subcomponents, so component analysis. This enables you then to really do some more refined economic modeling to look at how much would a, an intervention strategy cost and how much would be, would, would be able to recover by implementing that strategy. And then once you have refined that and you have your strategy in place, then you implement the program. And obviously, as you're implementing a water loss program, you will continue learning. You will find new things and you will refine your strategy. But at least you have a starting point when you're implementing your, your water loss control program that is based on economics. And it's not based on, you know, my gut tells me I should do about 50% of my system every year in terms of leak detection. Or I think, you know, replacing my meters every 15 years, that feels about right. It should be really based on, on data, on good quality data, and on economic modeling. And water loss control is not a magic bullet for all things that ail your system, but done effectively, water loss control will reduce your production costs and increase your revenue. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty wonderful balance, um, and, and that, of course, has implications for your customers, for your rate payers. It's a chance for you to make sure that the, the rates that you're charging do indeed translate to your system costs. Um, it's often something that the public is, is pretty proud to hear that the utility is doing. So how do we determine water losses with an AWWA water audit? There's a standard methodology. If anybody has, has unearthed Manual M36, it's the AWWA's publication on water audits and loss control. Currently, it's fourth edition. It is a tome, but everything is in there that you might need. So I'd love to highlight that resource right off the bat. Um, and when we talk about water auditing, we're talking about addition and subtraction of volumes. So hopefully that feels approachable. It will not look anything like this graph when you're done. I hope that we arrive at something a little bit more intelligible. So here's our lovely water balance. You'll see us flashing this up on the screen a lot today. It's the standard accounting tool. I'd like to note right off the bat, it's not to scale. Uh, so a volume belongs in each box, but just because all of the consumption boxes are the same size does not mean the volume is the same amount. Um, however, it is a, uh, each column does indeed represent a single volume. So the volume of system input or volume produced and supplied to our system is the same as the volume of authorized consumption plus water losses. Volume is conserved through our water balance. Um, and in the process of accounting, we start at the top at what we put in and we follow it through the distribution system to figure out where it ultimately ends up. So to begin with the box of water supplied, it has some smaller boxes in here that aren't on the screen that we'd like to talk about. Go for it, Chelsea. To begin with, uh, we have to talk about water that we input into our system. And when we talk about our system in a water audit, we're talking about the potable system. We're drawing our bounds there. If you have any raw water or reclaimed water or any water infrastructure prior to treatment that is not part of our drinking water audit. Um, to consider the volume input into the system, we think about what we produce, surface water treatment, wells, that sort of thing. We also think about water that's imported from a neighboring agency, from a wholesaler, through any sort of interconnection. Whether on a regular basis or an emergency basis, both are important to consider. And then we have to subtract volume that we export in a bulk manner so that we arrive at the volume input into our distribution system. Quick raise of hands. Uh, who has wells? Lots of wells, okay. Who has surface water? Treatment. A little bit there. Anybody importing water from a wholesaler? One here, okay. And how about exporting? All right. So lots of wells, a little bit of surface water. Okay, great. Great, good to know. When we think about measuring our volume of water input into the distribution system, we need to identify the meters that inform our water audit. So do wells have meters? Do treatment plants have meters? Are those meters influent? 
prior to treatment or effluent after treatment. It will be important to create an inventory of the meters you're working with and identify how those relate to the treatment process. Of course, when we think about meters, who has 100% perfectly accurate meters throughout all of their production? <laughs> Tom, I knew it. Awesome. Let's admit now that meters under-register, meters over-register, especially when we're talking about some of these bigger meters, um, they may not be exactly at 100%. And it's important to, to acknowledge that and to think about what we know about our meters' performance. Have you tested them recently? Have you calibrated them recently? Has it been 20 years and Joe down the hall thinks that they're doing perfect still? It's a good question to ask. Um, and so meter accuracy is pretty influential when we determine the fundamental input volume of our water bottle. You'll note that the theme continues through import volumes. Where are the meters? And also who owns them? Are they your meters at those inner ties? Or are they the wholesaler or the neighboring agency's meters? Do you know anything about their maintenance? Have they been tested or calibrated recently? You'll find yourself asking many questions, some of which may have immediate answers, and some of which you'll want to investigate over the next couple of years. Exporting. Guess what? We're still talking to you about meters. Meters are a big theme of our water audit, so you'll want to track those down and figure out also how they're installed. Um, is if a meter at, is after a 90 degree bend, how do you think it's doing? Not so well. I'm seeing some people rolling their eyes in the back of the room. I would agree. Um, you'll want to think about how those meters are set up for success. Just a great point. Here you see a highly accurate meter, right? A mag meter. Uh, and installed uh, at a location where I would argue it's probably not going to read 100% accurate, right? Would you agree with that? Have you have you seen such installation conditions on occasion in, in not your utility but others? <laughs> it happens, right? Uh, but as Lucy said before, the basis for our water audits, the 100% number that makes 100% of the total mass balance is our volume supplied, right? And our volume supplied comes from meters like that. And if we take it at face value, whatever inaccuracy is inherent in the measurement of that device here, then propagates throughout the water balance. So you might calculate uh, water losses that are not reflective of what's truly going on in your system because your meter might be overreading, and you might jump to conclusion that your system is highly leaky, but it isn't. It's, it's a metering issue. So that's why we, we spend so much time on, on really appreciating and evaluating what is the quality of the data that we're using in putting this audit together. And if we don't have test results yet, that's fine as well. But at least through the grading of our data, we can assign it a, a level of confidence. We can say, well, this meter at this location has never been tested, uh, but Given the installation condition, I'm, I'm not sure how good the data is. I'll give it a, a low grade there. The other question I have is, who was here at working at their utility when the first well was drilled? Anybody in the room 105 years old? No. So a lot of these things are inherited issues. That meter that you have at the effluent point of your treatment plant was installed for a reason. Perhaps it was monitoring chemical dosing. You needed to know approximately how much water you're producing to then think about your chlorine, for example. A lot of the technologies that we'll harness in order to create a water audit weren't initially designed to do this. And so, you know, it's not anybody's fault that maybe the meter's reading off uh, that was installed a long time ago, or it's got an alternate purpose for which it actually performs really well. But when we ask it to do things related to the water audit, there might be some data funkiness. So a lot of what we're doing is, is just evaluating our instruments and doing that as transparently as we can. It's not a process of assigning blame, but rather uh, bringing to light any data gremlins as, a, as is an industry-specific term uh, that exists in our databases. And a couple of things, more things I want to throw out there on, on, on the system input meters, um, that there is a clear distinction between calibrating a meter and testing a meter. Uh, so, for example, if we're talking about calibrating a meter, we're talking about the electronic calibration or the calibration of a 4 to 20 million signal or the pressure differential of your of your um, pitot, um, meter. Um, that's a calibration. It doesn't tell you the accuracy of the meter. It just tells you the accuracy of, of the secondary device that gives you the signal, right? Uh, and, and lots of folks, well, when, when you're starting out, you, you ask the question, are you testing your meters? And, and typically they say, yeah, we, we, we test the meters. But then drilling into it, it's actually just a calibration. So a true test of, of the meter's accuracy is not performed. So the, the meter that I showed you before at, at the 90 
if you calibrate that meter, you just check the electronics, it's going to be 100% accurate. But it's not reading accurately because uh, of, of the flow conditions that, that the meter is experiencing there. And we've even seen it happen that uh, a mag meter was calibrated in the 4 to 20 signal conversion fidelity was fine, but for some reason we were suspicious of its accuracy. The numbers that it was reading didn't make sense with what, with what was going on upstream and downstream. Something was off. And after some investigation and some volumetric testing, it turned out the meter was horrifically under-reading because there was a poor, uh, uh, piece of plywood stuck in the pipe from the meter's original install. For whatever reason, it got in there and was not found through calibration because that only is concerned with the electronics and not the actual primary metering mechanism, the guts of the meter. Any, any comments, concerns there on that? Uh, who is doing regular testing of their meters? T real testing? <laughs> not, not imaginary testing? <laughs> or calibration? Or both. Both. When we went through the, this exercise, we were in the pilot study that right. we did, and right. uh, that was the thing that we found out that our sort of rate dropped because we don't do the volumetric testing, we do the, sure. the calibration. The calibration. Okay. Right. So we don't mean to suggest that one is more important than the other. Both speak to different aspects of meters performance and are, are most useful when, when conducted in tandem. Great. All right, from there, um, since we've tackled the volume of water supplied, we're going to look now at the authorized consumption. So hopefully the majority of your authorized consumption is coming from your billing system. Is Pierre, question again, is everybody 100% metered on their customers? No? Yes? Can I have a show of hands who is 100% metered? Pretty much, okay. Um, so authorized consumption is made up by build authorized consumption, so that's that's the consumption that we're, we're getting revenue for, so that, that's the revenue water then. And then we have unbuilt authorized consumption, and as we're drilling into it, um, as we said, some of it is metered, some of it might not be metered. Uh, for some of it, we generate revenue. For some of it, we don't generate revenue, all of which is fine. And if you're not 100% metered, it doesn't mean that you can't put together a water balance. Uh, it's just going to have a high level, a higher degree of uncertainty. But you can still work with the same tools to get an initial assessment of your water loss in, in, in your system. So going further into the build metered consumption, which hopefully comes, comes from your billing system, We typically get that out of what I would call a black box billing system. Um, who of you has had to or had the, the pleasure, let's put it that way, to interact with a billing system? How do you feel about that? It's okay? Yeah. Because lo lots of times when, when, when we give these presentations, do those classes, uh, the experience with interacting with billing systems not always is as, as joyful as, as you are uh, saying there. Uh, these, these systems, again, you know, they have been probably purchased before you or, or you haven't had any input in it and now, now you're tasked to get the, the volume out of it. Because the billing systems, the way they are designed is to generate a bill and that's fine and typically they do that well. But what we are after here we want to get the volume delivered to your customers. So what, for example, if you have some misreads and you have to make adjustments to, to the, to the mis, because of misreads, uh, you got to interact with the billing system, right? And, and the folks will do that correctly also, so, so the bill goes out correctly. But what happens with that adjustment, the volume that we, we're adjusting there? Do we have to adjust the reads? Can we just only adjust the financial side? Uh, depending on how the system works, that might introduce error when you're saying give me the total volume delivered that then might have some significant negative numbers, some duplicates in there. So all of which can again lead to, to an overestimation or underestimation of volume delivered to your customers. And in so, our water balance there's a single box for the volume of bill metered authorized consumption. So whether you're a utility serving a homeowners association or the uh, behemoth Los Angeles Department of Water and Power you still have one box to talk about all of the volume that you sell and bill during an audit period. Uh, so there's a lot of data that supports that. And it's easy enough, I'm sure, to query your database and say, 
last year, what did we sell? And it pops out a number. But it's important to do the digging to figure out, is that number right? Is everything in that number that should be and everything not in that number that shouldn't be? Um, and, and, you know, what happens if a meter deadlines? What if it, if it starts spitting out zero consumption? Have I figured out how to track that and, and determine if that's real or not? Um, when, have my financial adjustments been made volumetrically? And does that affect my summary value? Simply asking for a 12-month summary query doesn't often provide us a lot of insight into how good the billing data is to reflect volumes and not just bills. But it might be the starting point, and that's mm -hmm. perfectly fine. So that, that's the initial volume that you get, and then next year round you start digging deeper and, and look into how, how reliable is that number that I'm getting this time around, um, just to improve the, the data reliability. So with that, uh, we then can move on to build unmetered consumption. Um, anybody has volumes that are built but unmetered? Tom? Well, what's, what, what would be an example, Tom? Well, a uh, hybrid rental for certain situations, so it's a uh, uh, construction site or something like okay. that. Okay. Uh, gardens, there right. are public drinking water fountains, okay. parks. I mean, there's a number Lots. of things. But, but still, you're, you're generating revenue for them. Okay, great. Yeah, great example, yeah. So th those are the things that you, you need to sit down with your folks, with your team. Uh, we haven't mentioned that. Doing an audit is, is not a one-man show. Doing an audit, as, as Tom, you have experienced, takes a lot of people. Everybody ha has some piece to the puzzle, and everybody can needs to contribute to providing all of those volumes. And so bringing your team together and really going through it step by step so do we have anything that we're billing but not metering and, and, and putting this list together? That's, that's the right step and approach. Um, how about other authorized consumption volumes? As Lucy said before, we, we are operating a distribution network, so we all not just need water to, to deliver it to our customers, but we also need water for operational purposes. Um, does anybody have to flush after you fix a leak? And that's not a loss, right? We do this intentionally, we just do not generate revenue for it. Um, how about the fire department? They typically use water, right? That's also not a loss, but we don't get the revenue for it. So there's lots of um, operational uses and authorized uses that we do not fill. We might not even meter them. I mean, so the fire department will not meter their consumption when, when they're out there fighting a fire. Uh, but there are ways of Again, putting a list together of all of those uses and then coming up with a reasonable estimation of what is the volume that we needed for, for example, hydrant flushing. How often do we do that? How long do we run for when we, when we do the hydrant flushing? What's the average flow rate? And that's a perfect way of, of getting to that number um, that is defensible then also for you. When we think about more examples. Uh, we had, we had somebody tell us that they have a meter on the mayor's house, but that's unbilled water. That may be an example. There may be certain accounts you want to work with. Um, so, again. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, that was often an anonymous comment, so we'll, we'll let that one slide. Um, so, think about special customers. Think about exemptions or people who are grandfathered into the system and have their own unique contract. That could exist, and that's legitimate. You just got to account for it. Um, other things to consider is your own buildings. You know, when you're at work and you go to the drinking fountain, what's is that water metered? Is it billed? Do you work? Do you have to bill other city departments like the parks? Think about those structures, both what's in place on paper and then what actually happens. It's important to consider. So we've done the simple math of taking our volume of water supplied and subtracting all of our authorized consumptions to end up at water losses. Eureka! Um, worth noting that. We spend a lot of time in water auditing talking about things that are not water loss to figure out what is water loss. It's important to not jump the gun and to instead spend the time on your supply and your consumption volumes to get those right. So in order to break our water losses down, we need to get a handle on the level of our apparent losses. Um, and as I said before, the majority comes from custom meter inaccuracies. But we also have unauthorized consumption, which um, in, in, in endearing terms we call theft. 
And then we also can experience some data handling errors. But the, the first and, and most important step there uh, to appreciate apparent losses is to figure out what's the level of performance of my customer meter stock. Here, quick raise of hands, who has a good number that, that is based on test data, knowing how your customer meters are performing? So for, for the for the audience that there were no hands raised and that's that's about the same that we see in all of those uh, workshops. So typically folks don't 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 have a, a lot of data available uh, that would inform their understanding of the accuracy of their customer meters. And the only way of, of getting to to a solid and defensible understanding there is to do some some representative and and random sampling and testing then of those meters uh, to inform your appreciation uh, as to where, where their performance is. Okay, so having now, you'll notice a theme, having subtracted consumption from supply to get water losses, we've now subtracted apparent losses from total water losses to get real losses. So all that's left over is our leakage volume. Um, and the component analysis that we'll talk about in just a little bit breaks that leakage volume down even further. Um, the audit software stops with the volume of real losses and values it at some production cost. All right, who is, who is ready for some exciting quiz? <laughs> Most of the faces I'm seeing look like the two on the lower right here. <laughs> Slightly perturbed. <laughs> who is the kid up there? Really excited. Any A class? <laughs> All right. This is just a, a quick recap, right, on, on all, all the volumes that we talked about uh, of the water balance, uh, just going through it in, in, in a little quiz form and really encourage you guys to, to, to participate. Uh, this, is, this is a fun exercise. It's not about, you know, right or wrong. But let's just review what we've done so far. Okay, next. All right. So we're going to allocate volumes to one of four boxes. Either build authorized consumption, generates revenue, and we permit it. Unbuild authorized consumption, no revenue generation, but still allowed. Apparent losses, so paper errors that lose water even though it did reach an end user. And then real leakage losses. So to start off with, we'll, we'll give an easy one. Fire department flushing. What are we going to call that? Somebody throw it out. Unbuild authorized consumption. I think if you send a bill to the fire department, they'll send it back blank. Next up, under-registering customer meters. Parent losses, Parent right, losses. sinking in. Great, excellent. How about pipe joint leakage? Real loss. Okay, great. Water theft? I'm hearing murmurings of all sorts of different kinds just, of loss. Just raise your voice. It's unauthorized. It's unauthorized? Yep. And when we look at um, unauthorized consumption, where do we end up? Parent, parent, parent losses. losses. It got to an end user. We just didn't really know about it, nor did we receive revenue. Customer billing adjustment. Where would that go? This is a trick question, and I apologize <laughs> for that. It depends on the nature of the adjustment. So suppose you have a billing system administrator who gives a customer a credit financially for a toilet leak on their side of the meter. They change the dollar figure in the bill, but nothing happens to the volume. And it actually is in the bill, the volume that passed through the meter. There's no loss at all. That's a legitimate, perhaps unbuilt, authorized use, given that they, were, they received a credit for that water. If you're a bit of a hardliner and you say, nope, no credit, that is then billed authorized consumption. But it might actually also end up uh, in, in, in the, the data handling error. Right? So, so, so it's, it's really specific how do you handle those, those cases and might they contribute to, to your data handling error issues or is it actually well taken care of and then it's within the authorized consumption. Yeah, another way to think about the toilet leak scenario is in, if you're working with billing software that in order to give a credit to someone, you can't just mess with the number with the dollars figure, you also have to adjust the volume as sometimes happens in the way these things are programmed, then you will be lowering the volume that passed through the meter, even though it did pass through the meter and ended up in their house leaking out of their toilet. Uh, something to consider is the nature of the adjustment and where it manifests in the data that you pull out of your systems. All right, moving on. Where do we put city park irrigation? In Wisconsin? Yep. 
<laughs> Should the build authorized? Should the build authorized in Wisconsin? Regulator. Should regulator? <laughs> <laughs> the public authority. Okay. Yep. Now, well, we know. now we know. We take that. How about an AMR device failure? Yeah. Yeah. I like the sound of that. An apparent loss. Just, just repeating it. Re yep. Apparent loss. The water yep. got to the customer, but we didn't register or track it, and so we did not receive revenue. Um, customer toilet leak. Can you repeat that? Build authorized. Build authorized. Mm -hmm. If we pick it up. We think about if the our, meter yeah. picks it up. <laughs> In our water audit, we talked about throwing a geographic bound of the input that we want to figure out which meters are closest to our distribution system to figure out our supply volume. The other end of that geographic boundary is the customer meter. So anything that happens on the other side of the customer meter is not relevant to the water audit. It may be in your public relations, but not here. How about the water main break? <laughs> Can I hear it again? Real loss. Real loss. It doesn't doesn't go in, in unbuilt authorized consumption? No? Okay. Great. You're right. It is a real <laughs> loss. Many times, though, I just, just want to throw that out uh, for, for folks not familiar with, with the methodology. Many times we see that, that uh, utilities track their, their water main failures, right? And they also calculate a volume for each failure. You know, that, that's the volume that we lost. And I think that, that this is sort of coming from the unaccounted for water approach, that then they have a tendency to say, well, I know how much water I lost there, so it's not really a real loss. It's, it's something that, that goes in the unbuilt unmeter. That's not the case, right? So any any main failure will be part of the volume of real losses that we are calculating doing this process. And if you have a year with a whole lot of main breaks and a whole lot of water loss related to those main breaks, hopefully your estimation of real loss will show that those breaks will be encompassed in the total volume of real loss that we calculate. <laughs> All right, so the final one, uh, storage tank overflow. Real loss. Real loss, so, so that, I, I would agree with that. But the other day in a workshop, we, we, we had a couple of folks in there and they said, no, it's not a real loss, that's actually an operational use. We, we do overflow intentionally at several times uh, throughout the year, um, and that's, that's correct. So if, if it's an intentional event, then it's part of the operations. Obviously, if it overflows because something went wrong, you, you have a scalar failure, then, then it's going to be part of your real loss. All right. Great. Thanks. Timing wise, we're doing okay. All right. Next slide. So, so we're talking about the audit software now. We've talked about the water balance. And fortunately, there's an industry standard tool for completing a water balance that does the mathematics for you. Um, so the American Waterworks Association publishes a water audit software, now in version 5.0. Um, that's the blue version. If you've used other versions, they were gray. We've updated to the blue version. And the water software does the exact same things as our water audit goals and then adds a layer. So the water audit software will allow you to complete a water balance. It gives you boxes for each of your inputs. It will let you document data validity with a qualitative 1 to 10 scale where you assess with some defined criteria how, uh, your, best, how your operational practices influence the quality of your data. The audit software also calculates for you a suite of performance indicators. Um, we'll dig into those a little bit later. And then it also highlights for you three broad areas for improvement in data quality. It won't produce a water loss control program for you because every utility has its own specific set of operational and economic parameters for water loss control. But the software does point you to the areas where if you wanted to get better data, here are the three sort of heavy hitters you should focus on first. <laughs> when you first open the software, when I say software, by the way, it's an Excel spreadsheet, so it's not actually a proprietary software package. Um, when, you, you cannot break it. That, that's, that's the good news. And if you do break it, you can just download it again. So um, There are a bunch of tabs at the bottom. And there are only three that actually require you to input information into them. The rest are diagrams, definitions, uh, guidelines, and, and other helpful resources. There's an instructions tab in which you get to put your name in, or you can volunteer someone else to do the software and put their name in. There's a reporting worksheet wherein you have to report your volumes and also a little bit of information about your system infrastructure and your costs. And then there's a comments tab. And people often neglect the comments tab. I want to point out it's your friend. Uh, do a good job of taking notes on your work such that when you do this annually and come back next year, 
you can actually remember what you did. It's very helpful. All right. So on, on the instructions, I mean, it's very straightforward. Uh, one, one thing to note in, in, in the color scheme in, in the audit software, the white boxes are where you're entering the data, and, and then the yellow ones are the ones where the, the, the volumes or values are calculated based on the data that you've entered. And then we have some purple boxes also where you can use some default values, for example. We'll, we'll show those later on. But on the instructions, I mean, that's that's really straightforward, nothing complicated there. Uh, who is filling out this software? Uh, for which system is it? Is it for? A uh, couple of key points you need to, to um, take care of is the periods you're doing this audit for. So you're doing it for a calendar year, are you doing it for a fiscal year? When is the start and end dates? Um, and you also got to select the units. So down here you have some interesting units. Uh, some folks on the West Coast still love acre feet. Still doesn't mean anything to me, but that, that's what they what they use. Uh, you, you can obviously use gallons, or if you feel inclined so, you can use even megaliters if you like that better. Any Canadians here? Any Canadians now? Um, um, so that's that's all you you gotta do there on on the instructions page. And we'd also like to throw out that you'll see. Uh, Subtle theme today is the koala bear. Um, Australia uh, that has had a prolonged drought, a 10-year drought, in which they turned to water distribution efficiency as a drought response mechanism. And so over the course of about five years, the entire country of Australia pioneered a lot of water loss control methodology and application. Um, and so if you're at all curious about what is technically possible, Australia is a good place to look. And so we appoint the koala bear as the mascot of water loss control. Okay, so this is a typical uh, data entry field then when we're starting out with, with the volume uh, supplied in, into the system. First, we have volume from all sources, as we said this morning, then water imported and, and water exported. So you're starting out with the summary volumes, and here again, you see there's only one box for the total volume of all sources. You will have 20 well fields, for example, uh, that contribute all the data to this one summary volume. So behind it, you always will have much more information that informs this one summary volume. Um, really useful and handy if you're uh, not quite sure what we mean by those different uh, terms that we're using in, in the audits. Uh, you can always click on, on the question mark that gets you to the definitions page. Then you can read through, okay, this is what these guys mean when they're talking about water imported or exported or whatsoever. And then you have a hyperlink uh, to, to get you back to, to this entry form. Then comments. Um, as we're teaching lots of classes throughout the country, really emphasizing on, on the importance of that comments field because, let's say, water from own sources, uh, someone has been appointed at the water audit guy and or girl, and they're like, great, I gotta do that as well. Um, and so you you call around uh, to, to to the folks at the treatment plant. How much water did we uh, produce last year? They give you one number and space or send you an email with a summary number, and that's it. And as you're following up, you don't don't hear anything from them, right? But there's a deadline coming up, so you gotta put that number in. The comments field then is your friend where you say, well, this year Joe really didn't talk to me a lot um, and I only got this one number. I really don't know what's, what's the background, uh, but let's make sure that next year we get an earlier start and have a meeting with him and figure out what's going on there. And then, then we have the data grades, if you can jump back. Jump back? Yeah. So data grades, that, that's now highlighted in green here. Uh, so for each of the volumes, you then need to assign a data grade. The data grade is going to be between 1 and 10. For each of those data grades, there's a clear definition uh, how you would um, be able to, to assign that data grade to your, to your uh, volume there. Um, the, the, the big thing there about data grades, as I said before, it's not about being perfect. The perfect data grade is the one that reflects your operations, your data. So anytime I see an audit where everything is a 10, that's a red flag. That, that just does, doesn't exist. 
and here you, you see the example that happens when, when, when you hover over, over the data grades uh, box, then you get the definitions. And one of the key things to consider there is, you know, is in order to, to get a grade of eight, for example, you have to meet certain criteria. But, and you need to meet all of those criteria. If you meet 90% of the criteria, you're not an eight. So the, the, the rule there is you gotta meet, exceed, or you retreat. That's basically the mantra that, that you gotta gotta apply there. And also you gotta meet of meet all the other requirements of prior, prior grades. So if you meet everything of an eight, but we, we had an example the other day, everything of an eight, but then the definitions for data grade of four, there's something that you're not meeting, that means you're a three. So that's 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 how you approach the data grades. So when you approach the software, the standard process is to gather your data, your supporting documents, and the process of data gathering is actually often a process of people gathering. It's getting folks in one room together to talk about the inputs into the audit software. This can be a great chance to, to you know, integrate some of your departments and, you know, grab a box of donuts and talk about your data. Um, at least if you bring the donuts, people might show up because data is not often a compelling subject, but it's pretty important for the water audit. When you get all of your data and all of your people, you'll want to review the data, you know, Keep in mind the question about your data story. Does it make sense? Is the picture that my audit is telling me and that my data sets are reporting the one that I would expect? If not, what's going on? Once you've, by committee, agreed on an input, you'll enter it into the audit software. You'll comment on what you did to get it. If you had to estimate fire department usage, <coughs> how did you do that? Did somebody work with, you know, the number of fires you had in a year and a per event number? Write that down. You'll also want to comment on any questions you still have. When you come back to it next year, what are you going to make sure Joe asks about his production volumes, for example? Then lastly, you'll want to select a daily rate for the input, which also still requires the input of a lot of different people. It's unlikely that any one person in a utility has all of the information about operational practices to be able to assess the validity of all of the inputs. If you are that person, I commend you. That is remarkable, but it's usually a, a committee operation. So once you give the audit all of your volumes, it produces a water balance. You'll note that this is familiar. It's a little more fleshed out to, to show the subcomponents of water supplied and to account for that volume of water exported. Um, but it does fill in the boxes for you. I like to encourage folks to not read to the third decimal. Those tend not to be significant figures um, and instead to truncate it the whole number. All right. One more thing that we need as we're filling out the audit is we need information about your system. So the length of mains of your distribution network, how many service connections do you have? And when we're talking about service connections, we really want to have all your service connections, all the physical connections, whether they be active or inactive. And we also want to have the average operating pressure. Now, question again, who has a good understanding of the average system operating pressure? Yeah, all right, great. Typically, that's 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 something where you initially land. Well, it's anywhere between 50 and 70, and you know, pick, pick a number, so to say. Um, depends on hydraulic gradients and so on. In order to really have a very refined appreciation of your system pressure, it requires data collection again throughout the system, where with pressure loggers and so on. And that's fine. I mean, again, the data grades will inform your confidence uh, in, in in the average operating pressure. Now, why do we need all of that data? Uh, we need the data about your system so we can um, calculate what a minimum leakage allowance is for the system that you're operating. Because we all know any system leaks and there, there's a technical minimum where, where below you can actually not go in terms of all the tools and technologies that we have out there. And we do these calculations based on the characteristics of your infrastructure. So how many main, miles of mains and services you're operating and the pressure you, you, you're operating your system at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every system is unique. Uh, the physics of your system will determine your leakage volume and those physics and the infrastructure. It's not the same as your neighbor. Um, so comparing in, in, in uh, broad brush terms, things like percentages, tends to hide the fact that every system, every system has a has its own technical minimum performance, and it also has its own economically efficient performance. And I hope that you'll, you'll focus on the, the performance of your own system when you think about where your goals are for water loss volumes. When we talk about water loss volumes, we're also talking about money. So the audit software requires that you give it your total annual operating cost, 
just so that we can appreciate how the scale of losses compare to all the other expenses that you're incurring in maintaining your infrastructure. It's also important to value apparent losses. As we mentioned, we tend to go at customer retail cost. Who bills all customers at a single rate all the time? Nobody. Who works with tiers? We got some folks. How about different account classes? We got some folks there too. All right, so you've got a lot of different ways to generate revenue at different rates. We want an average rate for the audit software, simply because meter under registration tends to occur at all tiers of usage and for all customer classes. We want to acknowledge those. Um, this doesn't actually have to be as complicated as it sounds. You don't need to do complex tier math to figure out where you are. Just simply take all of your revenue from here and all the volume that you sold and divide it out to come up with one average rate. And then lastly, the audit software asks for your variable production cost as the first step in valuing your leakage losses. I encourage you to also think about this as how much your water is worth when you think about reclaiming leakage. And so that may be the cost to produce. It could be power and pumping and maybe any groundwater fees you have to pay or import costs. That's one way to value leakage. Another is to use all of those production costs. But then to also think about deferred supply development, for example. There are other ways you can think about leakage or avoided liability. Or if you have a way to monetize public relations and think about what it's worth to your customers to recover leakage. You can also value real losses more creatively. Um, but the initial entry point into that is generally variable production.